All right, we have a special in-person, three-person episode of Jay's Analysis. We're going to be talking with our two good friends here, well, one wife, one friend, <laughs> about the classic John Coleman's Committee of 300. Uh, I read it years ago. I've been rereading it in the last uh, few weeks. They are up to speed on it, so we want to get their takes on the book. Um, it's definitely one that I think is a great introduction if you're uh, new to red pill content or understanding what is really going on in the world in terms of geopolitics. This is a book that a lot of people start out with. You know, there's books like, I don't know, um, Bilderberg Group by Daniel Estelin or um, Anglo-American Establishment by Dr. Carol Quigley. Those are all classics to start with. And I think this is one of those books that would count in that category. And he's the individual who was at one time in some capacity British intelligence, uh, according to his background, according to what he says, uh, he wrote many, many books. A lot of those are out of print. They're hard to get. Mm -hmm. This is the one that's still in print that I think most people are familiar with. Um, what did you guys think, first of all, reading this? Because I know that you both recently read it. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your takeaway? Well, this is the book. Well, whenever you start to talk to other people about what you've learned and you say they a lot, they are doing chemtrails, mm -hmm. they are doing this, they, they, they. And the other person just looks befuddled and they're like, well, who is they? Mm -hmm. And so this book is the perfect book to point them in the direction of when they are saying, who is they? Because it's got everybody's name, their uh, allegiances, their purposes, all the officials of all of these um, secret think tanks and non-governmental organizations. Mm -hmm. I have all of their names highlighted in here. So uh, <laughs> as we go through, we can see who is the lineup of perpetrators. Yes. Yeah. What did you think? He says that. He says, uh, we don't need to call them the they. We need to name them uh, because you can't beat the enemy if you don't know who the enemy is. So he he references that a lot in here. Um, so, yeah, it was rich, interesting because I actually had read this a while ago. And then to reread it now was interesting. You know, I had definitely a different perspective. My first introduction to Dr. John Coleman was, I guess, in 2020. And uh, I somebody had sent me a video that he did that was called the Committee of 300. Like, that's what the title of the speech was. And that was kind of my first introduction. And then I found his book on Tavistock which you know, retails on uh, Amazon for $5,000, but I read the PDF and it was so riveting to me. I read it three times in a week. And uh, that was really kind of, given my background, like that whole, just the background of psychology and philosophy and you know the social sciences and the origins was really what Tavistock it, from his perspective was about. So yeah. I read this one after that. And it, it is really interesting because the, they... You know, he does kind of tie the web together that I think is very uh, nebul nebulous for a lot of people. Right. And uh, he he does name names and he does also outline. Now, we talked about this earlier, uh, you know, we were just chatting that he, he doesn't have a lot of sourcing. So he just tells you from his recollection and, you know, you take that, uh, how these people are all connected. Yeah. And I, I think that that is very interesting what I would like to do the next time I read it which I did not do this time but the next time is I would like to as much as possible be able to take because he does talk about uh you know documents that you could find and I'd like to do some cross-referencing yeah just to not that we don't trust but you know it's always good to check yeah I think that uh, you know this he wrote this in the late 80s and yeah. published in the 90 early 90s and so it, a lot of books that were written decades and decades ago yeah. that that predict or pro, uh, project where we're going Mm -hmm. They don't always get everything right because not everything goes according to sure. the social engineer's plan. So sometimes there's going to be elements in there. I've read a few things in his book that I don't think are correct. But overall, mm -hmm. I think, you know, if, if you've read a lot of the foundational text of the elite, mm -hmm. then you're going to be able to recognize other books that are on the right track. Like mm -hmm. if you've read Quigley, if you've read all that stuff and you recognize that, oh, yeah, they're talking about the same people. Mm -hmm. So we know it's legit because it's, it's lining up with all the other guys and their, you know, establishment writing. So I, I think that this is one of those uh, whistleblower expose types uh, type books that is le legit. One of the things that I do think he does a really good job of is because this was so many decades ago is the getting the, in a very, um, he explains it in a way that I think is very uh, colloquial that a lot of people, laymen can really grasp uh, to understand what the intentionality is, what the agenda is. He lays that out very well. And in a way that is a, uh, I think cohesive and 
easy to comprehend. So yeah, it's very readable. Uh, it's it is written to I think in an older style of academia where you don't really cite things. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> unfortunately, there's not a lot of sources. And I mean, he, he mentions documents and people, yes. and you can find out whether or not most of that's the case now yeah. by internet. But um, it's not super well sourced. Yeah, he, no. he just says that he was privy to top secret classified yeah. documents, and he doesn't really give any citing for people. Yeah, yeah uh, one thing that we'll talk about later is the uh, demographics, which we'll put in the part two, <laughs> because it's a little edgy, but he completely predicted that part uh, way ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing, too, is that a lot of times people get trapped uh, in thinking, oh, it's that group that does it all. No, it's this thing mm -hmm. over here. It's CFR. No, it's Bilderberg. No, it's this thing. When all of these things really cohere and work together, because a lot of the same people are on the same boards of other things, right? And he like, talks about that. Yeah. He does a really good job of talking about how, like, most of these key players in what he called the Committee of Three Hundred are on the boards of many of these groups. Exactly. That it's not just one, yeah. and that they really all work, uh, you know, do the bidding for the other. It's more anyway. like three hundred clubs that all kind of yeah. borrow people from each other and work together and fight each other too sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So let's walk through the material. Yeah. Um, after so we've talked about the they we know it's a lot of uh, wealthy elites uh, old uh, bloodline families it's a lot of uh, NGOs think tanks uh, policy setting groups steering committees um, what next well he starts off talking about the best way to hide something is in plain sight so he <laughs> gives this uh, example of when the Nazis um, wanted to hide their new airplane they put it in an air show mm -hmm. so people wouldn't think that that's their secret weapon. Um, and that's kind of how these committees work is they put these things out in plain sight in the public and then people just. Um, yeah, like CFR, it. Trilateral Commission, Tavistock, mm -hmm. they all have websites. Yeah. I mean, you could go mm -hmm. to their websites mm -hmm. and see. So they're like, they're essentially semi-secret, right? Operating in plain sight. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the strategies as to why this has been more effective. So if you have something that's super secret, then it eventually leaks out. So they decided to just be, you know, semi-public. The meetings are private. You have what they call Chatham House rules where you can't mm -hmm. talk about what's discussed, yeah. but the organizations are all public. Yes. And the like front stories are all public. So they, they let you know what they want you to know. Mm -hmm. And then behind the scenes. And we're a humanitarian organization. They're all very phil philanthropic. <laughs> we're, oh, yeah. Uh, we're tax free, philanthropic. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we want to heal people in uh, third world countries. Yeah. He talks about how the people of these. Um, secret societies and clubs mm -hmm. they call themselves olympians yes yep. of ancient greece because they believe that they're the gods, gods on earth and this made me think of um the capitol rotunda in washington dc where it has the fresco of washington with the founding mm -hmm. fathers all dressed up in um, ancient greek robes and floating on clouds with you know flying angels around where is that where is that you've been to it you've told yeah, me that the, the, the apotheosis of washington that's what it's mm -hmm. called okay. apotheosis of washington it's in the capitol rotunda in washington dc yeah i i think it was interesting yeah that it, he says of their own mission they call themselves the olympian and when we see where a lot of the you know like the public groups now are like the world economic forum right, right? They, and they very much behave that way so you see the uh the mindset the worldview is extended mm -hmm. so even though some of the uh more uh prominent groups who maybe you know that they're putting in the forefront may have changed slightly they may have shifted but the the agenda and the worldviews have stayed the same mm -hmm. So uh, first, we want to talk about the upcoming event. Courtney has organized an event. We got a lot of great speakers there. Uh, we'll point you to the website. But tell us about this. Yeah, so we're calling it Rebels for Cause. And Cause stands for Creative Artists Uniting for the Sovereignty of Everyone. So if you're familiar with uh, Jay's and Jamie's work, you know that there is a, not a whole lot of organic kind of culture and art. There's a lot of culture creation, infiltration. So... But the thing is, we do actually have tremendously talented pro-humanity, pro-freedom artists and creative people. So I really, I think that, you know, I always say that one of the best antidotes to their agenda, because I think their agenda is a transhuman leading to a post-human world, that it is uh, controlled by an AI high borg mind that they program. And I think the best antidote to that is to be radically more human. And one of the things that makes humans, you know, I think very unique and uh, 
really special is how creative they are. And art has the power to effectuate change on a cellular level. And it is also really fun. And they do not want you to have fun. They want you to be scared. They want you to be atomized and isolated and filled with despair and fear. And we want you to have fun and to live life and congregate together and collaborate and enjoy yourself. So that is what we're doing June 3rd and 4th. We're going to have a bunch of speakers. Both of them will be speaking. We're going to have a bunch of music act. I'll be performing aerial acrobatics. And we're going to get some comedy and panelists. And it'll be a two-day event in Nashville. So come celebrate and uh, enjoy. A lot of big art. names. We'll have the yep. link below as to who all's there. She's still getting more and more people to come. Yeah. Already what? How many people roughly? You think? I think we have almost 30. Okay. Already. So a lot of big people, a lot of people you've heard of. Um, so get, get your tickets below. Uh, to that event, which again, June 3rd and 4th. Yep. Yeah. In uh, uh, or Nashville area. Yep. So we were talking about the John Coleman text and yep. we were talking about, you know, I think right away somebody said, oh, this is a conspiracy book because you're saying that a small number of people run the world. Well, you know, the people from the Kissinger group like Rothkopf have written books on the 6,000 managerial class that run the world. This is that's a mainline book. This is not even that far from that. This is saying, OK, well, there's the 300 people above the 6000 <laughs> that call the shots for the 6000 and then call the shots for the rest of the world, that man managerial class. And Jamie was talking about the Olympians. And this is actually terminology that are used amongst the power elite themselves. Right. Same idea as the wise men of the West. And this is referring to people like Avril Harriman. Um, uh, John McCloy uh, of the early days of the Council on Foreign Relations. So these are the power players. There's also books that talk about the old boy network, the origins of the CIA. These are the wise men or the Olympians that John Coleman's talking about. So not that not that far fetched. Nothing crazy about it. And I will, by, by the way, in the future, uh, be, co be covering the Patrick Wood uh, Technocracy Rising book too, which ties into what Courtney was saying. So uh, we're talking about we're moving through this uh, the networks, the groups, all of these interlocking committees and steering groups. Uh, where does he go next as he starts listing these things? Well, according to him, the head is the Queen of England back mm -hmm. then. I guess now yeah. it would be the King of England. Um, would be who they all answer to in this well, realm. Through the think? Royal Institute of International Affairs. Right, right. Yeah. and that's the, the Milner, uh, Rothschild, Rhodes, uh, Fabian, uh, Clive and Set, Astor group that was all behind the creation of the IMF, the creation of the United Nations, the creation of all these things that we know about today that we've been covering lately. So Coleman is basically saying the same thing that Quigley talks about. Doesn't he? He probably talks yeah, about Quigley. He talks, okay. Yeah, he does. He says a lot of the same things that Quigley yeah. says. Yeah. So go ahead. Um, well, he says the they operate on um, going against Christianity mm -hmm. as a, a rule. And the first commandment in Genesis is to multiply and subdue the earth. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing now is uh, to purposely subvert that. So depopulation and rewilding mm -hmm. of the planet. So immediately it's a, an anti-natalist, uh, anti-human agenda from the outset, which he was yeah. correct. Anti -genesis. Yeah. 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 So there's an aversion of that. Um, then and, when gets to and he talks about the club of Rome as being one of the like, you know, primary center, epicenters of all the controlling and so this is where we get this idea of ZPG, zero population growth, yep. which is to get the um, number of replacement to zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's already getting to where you can't, I mean, even Elon Musk was fussing about the fact that we don't have a replacement birth rate. Uh, but the idea is to get it to zero, which is pretty yeah. radical. Yes. And Italy was a testing ground because, you know, Club of Rome, but they wanted to de-industrialize Italy yes. and depopulate Italy and uh, make it a more depressed economy, socialist. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to roll that out across the world, but especially through America. Right. Yes. And they did that through pushing divorce and a bobos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that comes up in the Jaffe Berelson memo from the late 60s, which is part of the Rockefeller Foundation push for um, radically different ways of living, alternative lifestyles, mm -hmm. taxes on having kids, one one child policy. Look at the Jaffe memo if you've never seen it. I mean, it literally is proposing all of these things. And it says it's not to, for anybody's freedom. It's actually just to destroy society and to get the number of people down. Mm -hmm. So the Co Club mm -hmm. of Rome operates under the cover of NATO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they hate nuclear power because it makes countries independent. So they will always want to demonize that. Um, there's 40 known branch offices of the Club of Rome. Mm. So it's getting widespread out there. Well, that's well, an they old... work with FEMA, NASA, Tavistock, mm -hmm. right? So they're all interlinked. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Tavistock does all the uh, conditioning and programming 
uh, in order to make these things possible. So they do the essentially the culture creation, but like the things you were talking about, the divorce rate, the abovos, they that was not just to depopulate, but it was also to degenerate the culture. And Absolutely. The culture. Yeah, I mean, it was Tavistock uh, publicly in the last five or six years that was pushing and spearheading the whole TRANS movement. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually a big scandal. They were supposed to shut down their clinic, um, and they didn't. Of course, mm -hmm. which, they were sued. Yeah. 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 So, so that's what this is about, right? It's like, it's yeah. not, had nothing to do with people's liberties or freedoms mm -hmm. or any of that. It's actually just uh, social control. And I remember it was really interesting because uh, when I had read the, the Tavistock book, I, you know, started like trying to find as much information as I possibly could on them. And of course the earlier information is not as widely accessible, but I was like, what do they have to know? And this was before the scandal happened and it was right out there in the open on their website. It was all stuff on that movement. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Estelin's book on Tavistock, which mm -hmm. is from uh, my publisher, uh, Trine Day, mm -hmm. it's, it's good too, because it, uh, he read the Coleman book on Tavistock. And so he cites it and, and cause you can't get the Coleman book on, ta on Tavistock, yeah. but Estelin kind of re represents a lot of the arguments in that book. So if you're looking for that, it's the next best thing. And I think Esalen's book is interesting because uh, it's a good kind of to read both, I think, if, if you can get, you know, both of them. But Coleman does a little bit more of showing you the web and how it inter interacts with other uh, think tanks, steering committees, uh, NGOs, and other policymaking groups, whereas Esalen goes a little bit more into the weeds of the actual tactics and how they get executed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's great chapters at the end. Uh, Esalen's book goes through uh, unions, goes through the Rockefellers mm -hmm. taking over the unions. He goes through science fiction and Hollywood. Yes, there's a Hollywood. whole chapter at the back about how uh, you know Tavistock's involved in promoting these things. By the way, it's not just an English thing, right? Tavistock is sort of setting this policy that then the same elite pushes throughout the whole globe. That's why the yeah. whole globe pushes, you know, the rainbow skittles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he and Coleman talks a lot about how Tavistock operates through the United States, and that that's one of their primary target centers. Yeah. Right. And this is because the same power structure behind Fabian socialism using the British Empire as kind of a shell and then pushing uh, the EU through getting that in place. All this, it's all the same people that did that. They saw the United States as a threat that they needed to bring back under the aegis of the British Empire, which actually just became this inner clique that we're talking about. It's not really the Brits. It's the uh, power structure that runs that uh, power block, so to speak, which is a small, tiny clique. That's who sets up our uh, intelligence apparatus, which is really what's you know steering the country and really you know controlling things. It's not the politicians. The CFR tells and gives the policy to the politicians. Yeah, the and policy. a lot of the, uh, the, again, the overlap. So like Kurt Lewin, who set, you know, then set up the OSS, then becomes CIA, and he was one of the forerunners of the Tavistock Institute, creating all these, uh, you know, research on psychology and social science in order to understand how to steer the people in order to do yeah. the wartime research. And uh, some people also from the Frankfurt School uh, mm -hmm. make up some of these early uh, Tavistock researchers. Um, so again, these and things... that, that through Tavistock and the overlap of the Frankfurt School and the Fabians is where they came up with the intersectionality because they yep. wanted to destroy individual identity because they knew that people would be much more easy to manipulate if you divided them into groups. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What, what were you talking about art deco what's this um just the uh what we just talked about apotheosis of washington mm -hmm, the olympians the olympians mm -hmm. and use of um different styles of architecture greek styles and things like that coming from freemasonry but he talks about that these secret elite groups that we have today are inheritors of um the groups of like the illuminati um, the cult of Dionysus, mm -hmm. the cult of Isis, Catharism, and Bogomilism. Have you heard of that word? Yeah, the Bogomils are the people that came from Bulgaria to the West that influenced France uh, to start adopting what became Catharism. So medieval Gnosticism all uh, originates from Bog Bogomilism, which is Catharism. Mm -hmm. So the Cathars, I have a whole lecture on this from the Malcolm Lambert uh, History of Medieval uh medieval heresies <clears throat> and the the cathars are the ones that uh actually end up taking over like five castles in france mm. so they become these strongholds of gnosticism in, the, in medieval france and there's this war between the roman catholic church and the, the catharii and this eventually gives rise to other european um, proto-communist movements like the munza rebellion so the the bogomils influence the cathars the cathars then influence all these movements that 
eventually influence uh, Weishaupt and uh, communism. Mm -hmm. Joachim of Fiore is another famous character who influences the communists, and he's influenced by uh, some of these Catholic ideas. Well, he gives out um, several points of their unified plan. And the first one is one world government, um, unified church. And we're already seeing all of this come to pass. I mean, things like Chrislam and the Pope and the Ecumenism. Yeah, the Abu Dhabi uh, multi-faith center, um, uh, but all of Vatican II. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, we got many videos on the channel about the push for the world religion. And you did the, mm -hmm. the talk on the H.G. Wells book mm -hmm. that was way ahead of its time, uh, God the Invisible King, where H.G. Wells says, uh, I don't, I'm not an atheist. I worship Lucifer, and Lucifer is the symbol for me for a new world religion. Remember the talking about mm -hmm. God? Yeah. 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 So the second point is um, destruction of national identity. That's mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. Third point, destruction of religion, especially Christianity. Um, four, control of each and every person through means of mind control, what Brzezinski calls technotronics. Mm -hmm. So that's your um, brain implants, your what 5G. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the whole uh, uh, EMF soup that we that we live in that Brzezinski talked about 1972 or three in Between Two Ages. Mm -hmm. Between Two Ages subtitle is the Technotron American the Technotronic Era. So this would create human like robots, which is their goal. Yeah, and he called them robotoids. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> robotoids. The robots. Yeah, that was so, his word. Um, Number five, end to industrialization and production of nuclear generated electric power uh, to the zero growth society. Yeah. So austerity, great reset is the same thing that he's talking about, right? So when Klaus and everybody in the world are going to form something, a great reset, it's exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. Because it's one plan. Yeah. And he references uh, in, in that section, the global 2000 document. Mm. And he does that quite a bit throughout much of the beginning of the book. Um, and he says that that was setting out the plans for America for uh, the, the depopulation, but also the destruction of America. It was kind of like a blueprint in order to destroy the country. Yeah. The CFR is the engineer and ran corporation of the deindustrialization uh, of America, shipping all the jobs overseas yeah. uh, and making it a, a service economy. Alex Abea's book, Rank, uh, Soldier Reason, is really good because it, it charts how Rand Corporation, which is one of the entities that these people run, mm -hmm. the pre premier think tank from coming out of the Cold War. Rand Corporation didn't just design the Cold War. Abea says that they essentially deindustrialized America and created the consumer service economy. So that was all engineered by these uh, entities. Mm -hmm. uh, number six, legalization of drugs and corn. Uh, number six, legalization of drugs and corn. And we were watching Argo and they were talking about westernizing Iran. And at one point before they tried to kick all of the Westerners out, they're Movie theaters were running 40% corn. Yeah, this is a, a psychological warfare tactic that's been used many times. Um, if you watch Men Who Stare at Goats, they're doing the same thing at the end of the movie when the soldiers are in Iraq. They're like about to send out a bunch of Hollywood movies to change the culture of Iraq. Um, Miles Copeland talks about it. He says that we, we modernized Egypt and pumped a bunch of Hollywood in there to change the culture. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. What is he talking about next? Uh, number seven, depopulation of large cities, according to a trial run carried out by Pol Pot regime in Cambodia. So I have these highlighted people. So these are they, if you want to get this book and look at their actual names yes. and what they're doing. So, so hold on, got... what, is it, what does he mean by the trial city? I mean, I know about Cambodia and Pol Pot, but I'm saying, what is, is he saying like a 15 minute city? No, I wondered that too, but I don't think so. This just says depopulation of large cities. It is interesting but to note. It's Paul Post genocidal plans were drawn up here in the United States right. by one of Global Rome's research foundation. Mm -hmm. So I thought this was interesting, though, because when he talks about depopulation of large cities, I, I don't know. I think this is one of those things where, you know, the blueprints may have been set up, but then it plant, they do a lot of beta testing and they gauge the response and, you know, see see how things go. This is why I, I think it is so important to do things like this, because if people are aware, there is a potential to derail plans. And I think we've actually seen kind of the opposite, although this is where I went with it. It's like, it, it could be truthful. It could be one or the other. It could be either they didn't work. And so that's why we're not seeing that. Or it could be they're pushing everybody, because I really feel like they, 
They try to get everybody into the cities, you know, it's the track, stack, and pack. Uh, yep. to, you know, one, it creates the illusion of being overpopulated. Mm -hmm. And so that helps them to buy that narrative that's obviously a lie, which they admit it's of their own admission. That's a lie. Um, but Well, I think it's saying, too, that... But I think, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, the the yeah. other part of it, I was going to say, is that... But when they do that, they, they shove everybody into these cities, and then uh, we may just not have gone there yet. Where right. You get it's to down the, the road. Exactly. Because right. when you get to the 15 minute cities, then. Then you, you can be popular. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. What's the next one? Suppression of scientific development, except for those deemed beneficial by the committees. That's in Brave New World. That's mm -hmm. what Mustafa Mon says in Brave New World, because mm -hmm. they ask him, we just did that chapter with, with quite frankly, mm -hmm. they ask him, why are you suppressing the scientific discoveries? And he's like, we suppress them all the time. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Why, yeah. why would we give the the plebs these, you know, great truths? They didn't even want it. There's a hundred natural cures for C A N C E R. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Well, and, the and, and, uh, and many of the doctors who've uh, used them have uh, ended up in jail. Right. Or they just all get or on the same here. plane and the plane crashes. The plane crashes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Number nine. Caused by means of limited wars in the advanced countries and by means of starvation and disease in third world countries the death of three billion people this is the kissinger state department memorandum 200 um mm -hmm. the kissinger plan right so he mm -hmm. he's the one that really first pushed this idea of um food controls to radically depopulate the third world yeah he who controls the food controls the world the population and he uses the term useless eaters here mm -hmm. Uh, they want the population reduced to 100 million in the United States by the year 2050. Mm -hmm. We're pretty much on target with that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, they, oh, they're they so crazy because the population is already drastically dwindling, but then they want to just sweep up the rest of the people and shorten their life as well. So they can't even wait one more generation to fulfill their evil plan. They have to get it done as fast as possible, right? I think so. I think they have goals about for 2030, 2040, 2050. Um, so, I mean, we may see the U.S. population reduced to 100 million quicker than 2050. So, yeah. what's next? Um, demoralize workers in the labor class by creating mass unemployment. The youth of the land will be encouraged by means of rock music and drugs to rebel against the status quo, undermining and eventually destroying the family unit. Absolutely. And we see this with universal basic income. This is the mm -hmm. idea that, oh, you don't, you know, we can all just live on the dole. Uh, wouldn't you rather do that than go work at some job? In the last three years, we've seen, you know, tremendous step forward towards that with COOF and people not wanting to go back to work. And that was all, an ex I think, an experiment with moving towards this. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's next? And he'll later, he talks about how this was under uh, Tavistock, and then he later will go into, you know, a lot of the cultural infiltration that they did. What's next? Um, they want to keep people everywhere from deciding their own destinies by means of one created crisis after another, and then managing such crises. And this is what he's talking about, future shocks. Yes. And keep everybody off balance. So it's like, uh, Kufid, war in Ukraine. Fucking aliens. disease, aliens, yeah. just stack one on top of the other so you don't even know what crisis you're supposed to be uh, reacting to. And also to create a sense of apathy because people mm -hmm. feel so demoralized that they don't think that they can do anything. Mm -hmm. They think there's they have no power. Yes, he says it later on in the book that a, a, the future shocks lead to apathy. Yep. And that's coming from Alvin Toffler, global, uh, global writer who wrote Future Shocks. He also wrote Power Shift. Toddler says the same stuff that people won't be able to process these things. It'll just make them uh, apathetic and pliable. Mm -hmm. nope. mm -hmm. uh, next, introduce new cults and continue to boost old cults and rock music, mm -hmm. Rolling Stones, uh, Beatles, which was mm -hmm. also a Tavistock creation. I don't know that they're a creation, but they're definitely, uh, it's, it's very possible cool. that they were used or influenced, right? Because well, they're, they, their uh, popularity was a creation. I think they were prop. They were yeah. aided, um, yeah. and then. The, but the con the contentious part here is whether Adorno wrote the Beatles music, and yeah. uh, this is the claim that Coleman. Made. I don't know if he. But there's no evidence. For I don't it. know if they wrote all of it, but he but he does have these statements about where he contradicts himself. So I got an argument with this dude the other day about this, who was some uh, big fan of Adorno, and he's like, Adorno hated atonal music, and blah 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 blah. But the I thing, got into this argument the other day too. So the, 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 but the thing about Adorno is that he contradicts himself. That's what mm -hmm. they, they act like he only has one position. Actually, he was very into weird uh, new expressive forms of music that were not the traditional 
tonal systems or whatever. I'm not a music theorist, but um, he said different things at different times. And just because he preferred one thing does not mean that people in the Frankfurt School didn't want to weaponize other types of music. So it's entirely possible that he advised and consulted people at Tavistock, even if he didn't literally write every Beatles tune. Well, and then uh, this is a little bit later, but he does talk about it's not just the the music and the uh, popularization, but it's like the the language. So he said before the Beatles popularity, the terms like teenager weren't used and that, yeah. you know, beatnik. Uh, so a lot of these words and this uh, cultural language that's been in the jargon, was, it was designed to create a movement for uh, this generation and split them and divide yeah, them against to, to the Yeah, to create niches. Generation. Yeah, the, so the, the millennials hate the Zoomers, yep. the Zoomers hate the millennials, the millennials hate the boomers, the boomers hate the millennials. That's Which all designed it's, by Tavistock. It's not that that's, you know, so avant-garde or like so different, but he it was so extreme and it was a way of uh, creating, I mean, you really saw it in that generation. Yeah. I think it was a way of uh, weaponizing that generation against the uh, older generation, which of yeah. course, it was created by the older generation. But... Well, this is what Dave McGowan's works are about, which is that the 60s counterculture is uh, there were organic artists and musicians and people mm -hmm. going against the Vietnam War, but it was then steered into yeah. these kinds of things. So mm -hmm. the, the a lot of these bands like The Doors, they played a role of steering people's uh, you know anti-war or political activism. They steer it into things like degeneracy on purpose for uh, culture creation and for, uh, you know, absolutely. I mean, th this stuff is absolutely studied by white, uh, by think tanks and uh, written about in white papers, changing images of man, for example. He talks a lot about yeah. that. Um, and, and again, so people that are familiar with Dave's work would would absolutely resonate with that. We know that uh, not all, all of this stuff with pop music, and by the way, it's not obvious to everybody nowadays that the pop music is not organic. It's engineered, absolutely. And literally, like it's not even music anymore. It's yeah, all synthesized. It's all fake, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's in Brave New World too. Remember, guys, mm -hmm. if you read Brave New World, the music that they have, it's all you can't make music. Right. There's a central factory that produces the synthetic music in Brave New World. And I think that that's a, this is part why I'm doing this event, because I think that that is so much a part that's by design because they know how powerful this is why they changed it from, you know, the 432 to 440 hertz, uh, because they know how powerful music is and how it can really have the power to heal, to elevate humanity. It's so integral to our design. Mm -hmm. And so they use it. It can be weaponized or used to elevate. Well, think about the old churches that they built. I mean, those are made to resonate harmonics mm -hmm. and uh change your vibrations of your cells like cymatics and the yeah. secrets of the windows of the church are just like what happens when you do the tones on sand and it looks like that pattern so when you're going to church it's supposed to be a vibrational healing experience and they're taking that and reversing it yes. yeah turning it into stuff that's not music but it's just garbage yeah. yes uh number 13 continue to build up the cult of christian fundamentalism if you enjoyed this video, be sure and take use of the promo code for the show sponsor for this channel sponsor, which is chalk.com. That's C-H-O-Q.com. You can find the links in the description below the video. You get 50% off any of the great organic, actually better than organic supplements that they offer at chalk.com. If you want to support my channel, the best way to do that is to head on over there and use that promo code J50. That's J50 to get 50% off. You can also use the recurring subscription of J53LIFE, that's J53LIFE, if you want to sign up for automatic recurring subscriptions on those excellent supplements. Health is absolutely necessary in combating the toxic culture that we live in. I also would say if you want to get access to my books, head on over to the shop at my website and get signed copies there. Thank you. And donate very substantial amounts so of this money. is like christian millennialism mm -hmm. and the evangelical uh movement we'll, we'll talk about that later yeah and i think that we're seeing some of that with the uh c nationalism as well yeah. uh press for the spread of religious cults such as muslim brotherhood muslim fundamentals sikhs son of sam ayatollah so all of these crazy cults run by mind-controlled agents yeah yeah and British intelligence, by the way, he would know that because Muslim Brotherhood was for a long time run by British mm -hmm. intelligence. 
Um, and then on the other side, they want to export religious liberation ideas mm-hmm. around the world to undermine existing religions, uh, especially Christianity. Yeah, liberation theology. Um, we talked about that in the uh, Gladio podcast yesterday. Yep. Is that what else? Uh, they want to cause a total collapse of the world's economies mm-hmm. and political chaos. chaos. Yes. They are on target with that. They want to take control of the policies of the United States. Foreign and domestic. Yep. They want to give full support to the UN, the IMF, and yep. the Bank of International Settlements and the World Court. Absolutely. Definitely on target there. <laughs> uh, they want to penetrate pen- the cabinets. There's the Klaus line. We want to penetrate the cabinets yeah. of the world. Penetrate and subvert all governments, organize a worldwide terror T-E-R-R-O-R. <laughs> apparatus, and negotiate with terror. Whenever okay, terror Bush. Thank you, George activities Bush. take place. Tarish. The Tarish. <laughs> mustard gases. Yo. Did you know that um, that stuff coming out of Ohio is mustard gas? The dioxins? Mm-mm. That's what I'm Yeah. Okay, next. They want to take control of education in America mm-hmm. with the intent and purpose of utterly and completely destroying it. So they're, Also on target there. Yeah. Especially with SEX education. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, he says much of these goals come from the economic policies Malthus. based on the teachings of Malthus. Yep. And the British East India Company, upon which the Committee of 300 is modeled. Mm-hmm. And so the British East India Company he talks about later on um, is interesting. It's basically set up for trading, but most more importantly is the DRUG running. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's and the old the drug network. Worldwide cartel. Yeah. And he talks about the insurance companies and how they're essentially set up to protect those uh, cartels. And the, this is the model that uh, Cecil Rhodes took when he created mm-hmm. the British South Africa Company. Yes. It's based on the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. They're all yes. the same models. So they're yes. basically private uh, corporate governance. Right. So the structure of our system isn't publicly elected leaders. It's private, secret corporate governance. These people all work for the corporate elite. That's why the original uh, crop of people recruited in the OSS were uh, like Yale, uh, you know, Skull and Bones, all mm-hmm. those people, and people from Wall Street. And that's what the ESG model is now drawing upon. Yeah, ESG is like the culmination yep. of a lot of this because it's tying in all the environmentalism, which is that right. Club of Rome uh, ideology of austerity and anti-humanism, and antinatalism. And which, the intersectional politics. Mm-hmm it's all, all control mechanisms and remember that the uh, first global revolution book by the club of rome uh says that we will invent a new uh excuse for uh coming together which is that humans themselves are pollution yes so pollution and, and then the in their uh global reformation document in 1992 they admitted that it was propaganda yes. that they created because right. they needed to come up with a common common enemy common man. Enemy is man yeah, yeah. Man. yeah. <laughs> Um, is Malthus the one with the flies? Yeah, mm-hmm. so he's the English uh, Anglican economist minister who looked at flies in a jar and said, "There's not enough uh, food to go around, and if, if people keep uh, having offspring, we won't. Everybody will starve. So we got to control the population." Yes, yes. Um, and he also does mention with the East Indian British com- Company that a lot of the Committee of Three Hundred are descendants of them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Now, let's see, Adam Smith was British East India Company, mm-hmm. um, and some there's some other famous uh, philosophical figures, too. Thought- oh, John Locke. Locke had uh, some association or connection to the British East India Company, too. And I thought that was interesting because he talks about uh, Hayek and Smith and how they were essentially, like, of the same kind. They were created mm-hmm. to be essentially like the controlled opposition for the right wing of the United States. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been uh, saying that for a long economic. time and everybody gets mad at me when mm-hmm. I say that because all the libertarians freak out because they mm-hmm. think about high. But if you read uh, Road to Serfdom, the last, the appendix of Road to Serfdom is uh, why we need world government. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he says that. Um, and also they were both uh, essentially predicated on uh, Mandeville's philosophy, which is essentially Luciferian. This is why Adam Smith's is if you, I mean, it might be kind of reductionist to say it this way, but it's essentially the virtue through sin. You know, they glorify it like greed. Greed is yeah. great. Because, Ayn Rand, this yeah. is where we get Ayn Rand. Yeah. Good point. What's that movie, Wall Street? Greed is good. Remember it? Gordon Gecko? Gordon mm-hmm. Gecko. Yeah. Yeah, Bud yeah, Fox exactly. and yeah. Gordon Gecko. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of von Hayek, so mm-hmm. according to his economic uh, theories, the 
platform must be based on urban black markets, mm -hmm. um, small Hong Kong type industries utilizing sweatshop labor, the tourist trade, and free enterprise zones where speculators can operate unhindered and the drug trade can flourish. They want to end all industrial activity and close down all nuclear energy plants. And so, so, by the way, he's explaining uh, a combination of the, um, you know, Austrian uh, economics yeah. plus the uh, Fabian socialist model, which is always able to blend and mix both uh, schools of thought. So there's always this, uh, oh, no, I'm a libertarian free market. Oh, we hate the mm -hmm. socialists. The mm -hmm. socialists hate the libertarian free market. These are two uh, controlled uh, ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Royal Society, they had uh, uh, a version, they had two controlled opposition things going there. So you had John Maynard Keynes over yeah. here with Fabian Socialism. And you have these other uh, viperous, uh, you know, libertarian guys, yeah. but they're really serving the same ideas. And just think about the, the, the figure of Ayn Rand. Who was she hanging out with? She was hanging out with Alan Greenspan. Yeah, because they're all part of the same and, there, and they're not a actually anti-socialist there is a and i i mean i can't prove this is i think it's speculation but that she was like the mistress of a rothschild oh really and, yeah i i've read this in several different like publications well but... if you look at uh uh fountainhead mm -hmm. yeah it's basically and that's what they said that the fountainhead was being yeah. used to be a narrative control exactly yeah yeah so um, and then one other thing I wanted to point out about uh, von Hayek and the, uh, you're saying, I'm blank, keep going and I'll remember it. Yeah. Um, well, uh, David Rockefeller uh, studied under von Hayek. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was influenced by both the Fabian socialist Lasky and wrote his dissertation, uh, his, I think his master's under von Hayek. And if you read Rockefeller's biography, he says, I was influenced by both the Austrians and the Fabian Socialists. So he's like, that's why as a monopoly capitalist, I love Mao Zedong. Yes, uh, that's what I was going to say, is that uh, von Hayek, uh, oh, when the, Coleman talks about the free market and how free markets is really uh, kind of a lie yeah. because you really don't have free markets, yeah. that it's a way of shipping out everything overseas. And it was a way of mm. deindustrializing the United States. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've said this for so long, and when you say this, all the libertarians say, oh, you're a socialist, yeah. even though I critique socialism all the time just as much. So, yeah. yeah. What's next? Um, well, Brzezinski's talking about the technotronic mm -hmm. era, and it's weird because um, they talk about cloning mm -hmm. and robotoids, um, people who act acted like people and who seemed to be people, but who were not. So that is getting weird. <laughs> so wait, Coleman is saying that they will do that? Or? Yeah, yeah okay. that there will be cyborgs, essentially. In the United States, um, what's he talking Oh yeah, the Technotronic Era. The book is an open announcement of the manner of methods to be used to control the U.S. in the future. Cloning and robotoids. So weird. Mm -hmm. And now they're doing cloning meat to eat. Right. So they that's the first cloning step. chickens too. Yeah. And remember when they cloned that sheep dolly? That was so long ago. Do you think they just packed up the lab and said, okay, good sciencing? But, well, okay. and yeah, I mean, in, in uh, between two ages, within the first 15 pages, Brzezinski says this. This uh, I don't remember the cyborg part, but he talks about how we'll basically have Skynet or Skynet and we'll uh, control everybody through Skynet and man will be mutated into a new form. He yeah. says that on page 15. He says that we're moving towards a technotronic era that could easily become a dictatorship. Yeah. Uh, he also says that our society is an information revolution based on amusement focus and spectator spectacles. The spectacle, yes. Yeah. Society of the spectacle, yeah. So info war and spectacle. Um, <clears throat> the technotronic era talks about the masses as if people are some inanimate object. Yeah, Brzezinski says that. He says it's much easier to sway an entire mass of people. Mm -hmm. And he's, he talks about the people don't, won't remember past two weeks in the news cycle. So they like the news cycle just like brainwashes people. They only know what's going on at that moment. They won't remember the news two weeks from two weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, the internet, by the way, has fostered that big time. Um, he talks about pre crisis management institutions such as FEMA. Mm -hmm. um and then that made me think of that movie minority report with yeah the pre -crime mm -hmm. well they wrote, started rolling pre-crime out when i was first writing uh in 2014 mm -hmm. so when i the what the my analysis of minority report that made it into the first book uh i talk about the different programs that were rolling out in the uk to uh, do predictive tracking and tracing for pre-crime so it's a real thing and he was writing this in the 80s and 90s 
he was writing this as uh, Carter's national security advisor. So this isn't some crap. No, no, no. What? Coleman was writing this. Oh, yeah. Brzezinski yeah. was writing this. In, uh, he was chosen by Kissinger and David Rockefeller to head the Trilateral Commission in the 1970s because they liked the book that he wrote. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Brzezinski was Carter's national security advisor. Right. Yes. And he continued in that same basic role uh, for Obama, even though it wasn't public. He was just basically in the background consulting Obama, just like Henry Kissinger has been there forever consulting and telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. And he talks about all the different groups, again, that, how they're not just members of one. So he says he was not just writing as a private citizen, but Carter's National Security Advisor and leading member of Club of Rome, member of Committee of 300, member of CFR, member of the old Polish Black nobility. Yeah, Brzezinski's no joke. I mean, Between Two Ages is one of the most important global elite texts that lays it all out. And it was written in, 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 I think, 1972. So it's like people are still clueless as to whether this exists. One of the most powerful men in the history of the you know, American uh, super state ever uh, wrote an entire book about all this, way before Klaus Schwab was on the scene doing it. This is an oldie but goodie. Um, remember the Beast computer in mm -hmm. Brussels, Belgium, six six six. That takes me back to that was, classic. That's classic nineties conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Totally. That was one of the first things I read about uh, <laughs> in the nineties when I was getting into conspiracy stuff. Ninety eight. Yep. So crisis management is a huge part of this, um, mm -hmm. creating <clears throat> crises and then problem and, reaction solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Arc of crisis was Brzezinski's strategy for the post Cold War uh soviet states and so he set off this chain of crises throughout those states to destabilize them and bring them under in the cold war to bring them under western influence and it worked so they take these these uh strategies of tension gladio which we just lectured the gladio was all a gigantic quote, quote strategy of tension uh and you had brzezinski kissinger uh, uh all the cia guys like paul hallowell uh, Ted Theodore Shackley, James Hughes Angleton, they were all instrumental in getting Gladio going, which was, again, strategy of tension, caused the crisis. People then turned to uh, the state for safety and security. So they've known this for a long time. That's how to, that's how to control systems, uh, control systems work. By the way, and I'm not saying that because the Gladio was in place to oppose the Soviets, the Soviets are the good guys. It's just two different control systems. It's two different mob families. Fighting each other. Yeah, so because they they helped Stalin come to power, and then Stalin didn't take Marshall Plan A. That's what kicks off the Cold War. But I think a lot of these entities wanted the Cold War because the Cold War created the apparatus uh, for the global uh, infrastructure for the whole you know Skynet stuff. Uh, the Cold War, according to Alex Obeya, deindustrialized and changed America, and then they just transitioned into the war on TERROR. Mm -hmm. Same people behind the Cold War. Rand Corporation, all these people, they engineered the new war on TERR. That's it. That's all they do. And then now it's a new war, which is the biosecurity state, because we're all emitters of viruses. Mm. Oh, good point. No, it's actually in the documents. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's, if you read the uh, NATO PSYOP document, if you read the British Ministry of Defense transhumanist document that yeah, they declassified, the it says that the new, the new threat is, is biosecurity. Yeah. Human augmentation, which she talks about yes. here too, yes. the precursor to that. Yeah. Um, I thought, I don't know where you're going next, but I just thought this was an interesting point talking about the two control systems. Fake right wing and, heritage. Yeah, yeah, the Heritage Foundation and and how they advance things through Reagan's presidency. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, I used to say that I feel like they align with just from my observation i mean this is before i knew really anything but i felt like just looking at it you know as an observer it looks like well philosophically ideology they align with the left but they actually seem to get the more of their agenda accomplished through the right mm -hmm. and he talks about that yes and how yeah, that was exactly. very intentional yeah yeah i, I gotta dig up uh i have an, an old heritage foundation publication from the, the reagan era and it's hard to believe it's real, but it's absolutely real. And it's talking about how um, the right needs more uh, communism and socialism. <laughs> so this right. is the America's concert, you know, premier so-called conservative institute. It's just a neocon thing. But the neocons are all former Trotskyites. So yes. the origins of neoconservatism are actually revolutionary Trotskyism. What's next? Um, let's see. The morale of nations is at an all-time low. <clears throat> that is by design. And I think that kind of kicked off in earnest during the Clinton administration. 
because we had never seen such a thing as a president being questioned about indecent things, that all of those things would be covered up. Like those are were, demoralizations yes. and they demoralize the office and the country. And we've seen that, especially with, uh, you know, creepy Joe, right? Yes. So um, there was a thing called time perspective and morale, which the club of Rome publication concerning how to break down the morale of nations and individual leaders. And this just happened again in Nashville when Joe Biden mm -hmm. came to talk about the, um, what happened. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Licking was, ice cream cones. Yeah. yeah. And he was trying to, you know, tell kids about ice cream and come into his room in the middle of a press conference about a tragedy. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, we got a good uh, bit here. I want to remind you guys to head on over to chalk.com. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off any of those excellent products over at chalk. Like the Irish moss, if you're looking to balance out your hormones. Uh, for those ladies out there, if you're looking to boost testosterone, guys, there's the Tonka Elite, who proven in peer review studies to boost testosterone. There's the Action 2.0, great for boosting your energy levels, as well as many other products. Use the promo code J50, that's J-A-Y-5-0, to get 50% off, or the promo code J53LIFE, J53LIFE, to get 53% off any recurring subscriptions. And I know that when you order chalk, you're going to want it coming Every month, you don't have to put all the information back in. And that also supports us. Uh, be sure and go and subscribe to uh, Grand Theft World over on Rockfin, uh, also our uh, supporter. And subscribe to Courtney on Rockfin and Rumble and anywhere else that you want everybody to go to. Yeah, that, those work. I okay. mean, yeah. And we've also got the live event. The link is below for yeah. uh, Courtney's live event, the Rebels for Cause. And Jamie's channel also is uh, getting up there. You're getting up towards mm -hmm. what six, seven, eight thousand. Mm -hmm. Good nice. job, nice. And Jamie's books are also uh, available at my website, jasonalysis.com. In the shop, you get access to all of our books, signed copies. So avail yourselves of those things right now.